The resurrection is a very interesting mystery for a number of reasons. The first is, there are no witnesses. When we read the scriptures of the resurrection, we never actually read an account of what the resurrection looked like. This is unique. But it also makes it a little bit difficult. Now we have some mystics that have been shown visions of what the resurrection looked like. And that would be good for our imagining and meditating on this mystery. And ultimately, of course, the scriptures give us the visions, the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, which is good material to meditate on. But we want to note this as we go on because if we don't have the visuals, if we don't have the witness of the event, and I think that's good in one sense because it is such a sublime mystery, we need to then think about the implications of the resurrection in our meditations. Now, there are some very deep theological implications which I am not very uh, good at explaining in a lot of detail, which is probably a good thing for you because then I'm sparing you from having to listen to all those details. But let's look at the basic truth of the resurrection of Jesus. He rises from the dead as part of his triumph over death. One of the things we want to be very clear about is while our attention span is limited and while we have to focus on one thing at a time, the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ is not just his crucifixion. It's not just his agony and his scourging and his crown. It's not just the way of the cross. It's not just the resurrection. It's not just the ascension. It's the incarnation as well, etc., etc. So the Paschal mystery of Jesus is one mystery which, to make it digestible for us, we focus on certain things. And that's okay. What we want to focus on here is that by his death, Christ conquers sin, and by his resurrection, he conquers death. We don't have life except in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting. The gospel that we have today, this week we have from St. John chapter 6, which is on the Eucharist. He multiplies miraculously the loaves of bread, which is prefiguring the Holy Eucharist. And then in his discourse in the synagogue at Capernaum, which we have an excerpt from today, he speaks of the many implications of this, uh, the Eucharist. And that is that we, it is union with Christ. And that as long as we are united to Christ, most intimately, of course, in the Holy Eucharist, then we are benefiting from life in Christ. And that is, of course, the whole point of the sacraments, is they are the way in which we practice, in a concrete way, this union with Christ. Baptism brings us into union with Christ. Confirmation strengthens that. Eucharist fulfills it. Penance and confession reestablishes that union with Christ after sin has corrupted, etc., etc., etc. And in the Eucharist, of course, we see the, full, the, the, the fullness of this in this world and the fact that whoever is given to Jesus by the Father, he does not lose. Whoever comes to him is not turned away. It's all about that union because if we are in union with him, then we experience his life. And so he is resurrected from the dead. We, therefore, should not live as the pagans do. We should live this life in Christ. There's a lot of implications for this. I'm not going to go into all of them tonight because we don't have the time. But just two simple basic approaches. One is we don't approach this life the way the pagans do. We live for Jesus resurrected. And therefore we live for heaven. So we do not fear death. We do not invest in this life any more than necessary because we have this life in Christ. The world is dead to us because we live in Christ. We cannot live like everybody else because we are not like everybody else because we have life in the resurrected Christ. The other implication that being from that then, that we should be living our lives for heaven. 
for living in union with Jesus Christ. Not living for this world, but living the supernatural life 